Last week, the first Sunday in Lent, I introduced a word to you. The word was serzanti, and I linked it to the word covenant because serzanti means nothing without the word covenant. A serzanti covenant is that in which the greater power grants a relationship with a lesser power. And in last week's uh, gospel, uh, Old Testament lesson, uh, the covenant was granted to all through Noah. Noah and the symbol of that covenant, which was God will not destroy us, even though we were perfectly capable of destroying ourselves, was the rainbow. And that was the covenant from last week. And in um, this week's particular Old Testament lesson, we have Abraham. And he has his name changed from Abram to Abraham. And God is making again another statement of covenant or as I said, evoking the words from Psalm 25 last week, covenant and faithfulness. God is being faithful to uh, Abraham, Abraham and his descendants, which will multiply forever. So covenant and faithfulness go hand in hand. And, and the other word from Psalm 25 that I linked for us was faithfulness and love. And I ended last week with the idea of the symbol of love, the sign that God gives us is the cross, Jesus' love for us on the cross, and how that cross image is changed by that love from something horrible to something overwhelmingly giving and loving. And so we have in today's scripture, especially in the gospel, a passage that I evoked in my sermon from two weeks ago. Now, you're probably going, we have to remember that far back well, all I want to remind you is it's all online. You can watch it again. But in that, for the transfiguration, I was evoking why Peter might have been as troubled as he was walking up the mountain with Peter and James following Jesus. And it had to do with the chapter that was in Mark's gospel, a couple of chapters ahead of where we are today. Uh, and it's the chapter we actually heard today. And it's the one with, you know, get behind me, Satan, after Peter uh, is rebuking Jesus. Jesus rebukes him. And then Jesus talks about the cross. If anyone would become my followers, let them deny themselves and pick up their cross and follow me. For what is it to gain your life? All right. Now it's to follow me is to lose your life, to really gain your life in following me. So we really have before us this idea of what is it to be committed to following Jesus by picking up our cross. And wherein does that particular image guide us? Now, through my, my time with you, I've talked a bit about commitment in this way. And I've looked at commitment in five parts. The first four parts I learned from Bishop Furman C. Stow, the late bishop of Alabama, and I say late not just because he's no longer the bishop, but sadly Bishop Stow died about 10 years ago, was an amazing teacher in the church. And I first heard him say these words about 27 or 28 years ago. I have to keep doing the math. And it goes like this, and you've heard me say this, all right? Evangelism calls persons to commitment. Worship celebrates that commitment. Christian formation teaches the meaning of that commitment. Stewardship is the practice of that commitment. And he was doing this in the context of what it is to receive all that God has given us and then become God's managers, God's stewards, and how we live our lives in that regard. And when I was on the stewardship commission in the Diocese of West Virginia, we had an incredibly deep conversation one day, looking at these four points and deciding that we could add a fifth point. And the fifth point that we added is one that I think Bishop Stow would certainly endorse. And it was, it's this, discipleship that leads to apostolic action is the outcome of that commitment, that commitment to Jesus that commitment to be faithful to God as best we can as God is committed to totally being faithful to us. God is totally committed to loving us. 
So our commitment within our own frailty is to try to be as committed back to being faithful and being loving. Now, I'm also blessed with um, uh, not only having helped create those words, but I also helped create my son, Adam, who, as you well know, is a priest. And, and one of the benefits of having Adam is actually watching him preach and take concepts that have been placed before him over the years and watching him live into them and then watching him take them to new places that I might not have imagined where we could take them to. And a few weeks ago, he preached a sermon which was based on the cross. And he made some very <clears throat> useful points about the cross, building on stuff that I think I've taught for years, but he said it in a way that really made sense to me. Now, you've heard me talk about Bishop Brent's colic for mission. Lord Jesus Christ, you've stretched out your arms of love on the hardwood of the cross that everyone might come within the reach of your saving embrace. So clothe us in your spirit that we reaching forth our hands in love may bring those of you who do not know you to the knowledge and love of you for the honor of your name. Adam was making a point about discipleship and apostleship. So I've, I've worked with Bishop Brent's Colic for Mission. When I look at the cross, there is a horizontal aspect of the cross, and then there is a vertical aspect of the cross. And for years, I tried to talk about the deep nature, of how deep in word is that cross. And I could only imagine it going so far deep. I, I was even in my church in Tuscaloosa, saw the people acting as community in such a way that I said, oh, this term deep church that I've heard floating around fits them. A group of people who gather with a willing expectation to share intimately the love of God. But as I heard Adam preach on what it meant for the cross to go that deep, he linked it to being a disciple. He said, the disciple goes deep. And then he gave me the image I had been striving to find but could not see. He said, it's deep as if it's the well where the Samaritan woman is with Jesus. And she says, I would like some of that life-giving water. And that well is so deep. So the cross is deep into that well. A disciple is one who goes deep, deep into study deep into uh, relationships with those that they know and care for. I, I, I can articulate some of that study idea here from <clears throat> Education for Ministry, or the group that meets at Panera Bread on Saturday, or the women who gather on Tuesdays, uh, or the folks that are going, the women that are going on the retreat in a few weeks, or the people who take time reading Bible at home, personal growth that they, there's so many of those opportunities here. The, folks who study the rule of Benedict. You, you can see how that is a way of going deep. What is it for us to have a Sunday school that does godly play to give a sense of going deep? That's building disciples. So when you see the cross and you see the vertical part, think of it as discipleship and what is it to go deep. And, but then there is the horizontal part. And the horizontal part that Adam articulated, and I fully embrace, and it fills in with what we wrote in West Virginia, this is apostleship. What is it to be an apostle? An apostle has their arms, like Jesus did, stretched out wide to embrace the world and to go forth and share the gospel in the world and embrace those who are in need of love. We're doing that here this week with family promise coming to stay in the classrooms to help those folks find jobs and housing. You think about it when folks go to Keensburg to feed the hungry or down to Brighton Gardens to bless those and be blessed by them who are elderly to bring the love of God there. These are just small examples of what it means to go out. What is it to share Lenten alms through Episcopal Relief and Development? An apostle is one who is wide. Much as Jesus' arms are on the hardwood of the cross, ours are open wide as well, offering that saving embrace. 
This idea of hearing the cross in this light, when you pick up the cross, this is what you're picking up. You're picking up not just something which would weigh you down to die on Calvary. You're picking up something that will give you life as a disciple and as an apostle, living into the commitment to follow Jesus Christ. Or another way to say it is, God is committed to us in this covenant that God makes with us that God does not have to make. God is faithful. God is loving. And all we're asked is to respond by trying to be as committed as we can, to go deep as a disciple and to offer love wide as an apostle. All these words I offer in the name of God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>